Now, I, it gives me great pleasure to make a little bit of a transition here in our general session, and I'm going to invite our three distinguished panelists to come up to the stage. And they're going to speak to you. We got a lot of feedback last year, um, especially from newcomers, that what they really wanted to hear was from distinguished leaders in the community about the why Kowali and even some people who have been in the community for a while. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce three very distinguished speakers for our keynote panel. And they're both old timers and newcomers, so I think we'll get a very good perspective. We have Pat Burns, the VP for Information Technology and the Dean of the Libraries at Colorado State University. We have Eric Denna, the CIO at the University of Utah. And we have Spencer Golden, um, Director of Enterprise Systems for Haverford College. I'm going to turn it over to them, and I'm sure they're going to share some wonderful ideas and experiences with us. Pat. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Hey, we're a community. We're all here about ourselves, and you can do better than that. Good morning. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Thank you all. So our presentation continues the theme of the morning. It's the money, oh, and it's the software, oh, and it's the community. So we're going to talk about what we think we are in higher ed currently. And our current perspective is as follows. How many of you remember the Spellings Commission report in 2006 that wanted to change higher ed into K-12? <laughs> And we've seen a number of messages from the Chronicle. University leaders de desperately need to transform how we do business. The future of higher education and other imponderables, there's great uncertainty right now in terms of our future. The digital scholar rethinking higher education business models to echo and follow on to what Brad said. Emory University is gonna close three departments as part of restructuring where Emory has the 13th largest endowment of any institution in the world, and they're doing that. And there's a lot of buzz about student debt and confrontation of new costs, and you can see it's even in the popular literature, the New York Times. Obama and both presidential candidates are talking about the cost of higher ed not being sustainable. And the Pew Research Center Agree or disagree, college costs in general are such that most people can afford to pay for a college education. 75% disagree. Here's a map of all of higher ed, and the ones shown shaded are the states cutting higher ed budgets in 2011. How many of you are from a shaded state? Yeah, look at that. And then the NSF came out with a report raising alarm over falling state support for research universities just a month ago. And that's the University of Colorado just down the street from us. Colorado may be the first state in the nation to defund public higher education. Sequestration may be upon us. We're looking at another 109 billion of mandated cuts in 2013. And here's something that fascinated me. We're going after donors to sponsor individual classes now. Are we gonna be able to teach our classes? Let's see who would donate to that class. Gracious. And I like the onion. Recession plague nation demands new bubble to invest in. <laughs> There's a lot of sentiment that that new bubble might be higher education. And the big question of 2011 is who needs college? The Theo Fellowship pays 24 talented students $100,000 not to attend colleges. What kind of society are we becoming? That was from the Chronicle. We know about MOOCs. Where are they going? And how are they going to affect our business model and our economies in our institutions? Bills on the table in several states include limits on salary, sabbaticals, and collective bargaining. So, Legislatures are micromanaging higher ed because of the situation we find ourselves in. The perfect storm. State support is going down. Student tuition is going up. Student debt is going up. 
federal support, one could argue, is going down, including for research and probably Pell Grants. We don't know how much yet, but that's probably true. And higher ed is under attack from multiple constituencies. The professoria is shrinking, tenure is in danger, we are experiencing brain drain as a country for the first time in forever, basically, since World War II anyway. How will we as a country attract and retain the best talent? And where is the value proposition for higher education today? It's being questioned from multiple fronts. And then we see things coming out like how much are students learning? How many of you have read Academically Adrift? If you haven't read that, you should read that. It'll scare the hell out of you. It says that not very much. And again, the Pew Research Center, the value of a college education, 57% think it's only fair or poor of our citizenry. So are we going to be epitomized by this slide? I hope not. So how should a CIO react? Reducing one of our largest expenses, so self-determination in administrative systems, that's what Koali is all about, right? By higher ed, for higher ed. If we adopt community source products, and in particular we can leverage them over multiple campuses and even multiple institutions via shared services across multiple institutions and multiple campuses, we can keep millions of dollars in college budgets. And just to follow on to what Brad said, so what we're going to talk about today are three very different institutions implementing community source. There are CSU on the left, 1,500 faculty, Haverford, 150, University of Utah, close to 2,000. You can see the range in numbers of students and number of staff. The annual budgets range from 80 million to 1.4 billion. State support goes from zero to something a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> And look at the range of IT budgets. We at CSU are best of breeds in our administrative systems, Haverford's legacy, and University of Utah is PeopleSoft. You can see the difference in sizes of IT staff. And the point here is we're covering essentially the entire spectrum of higher ed institutions. And so we're so different, it brought to mind, there's, this is a road sign of a small town in Colorado. And this is true, I saw this about 20 years ago, and unfortunately I forget the name of the town and didn't snap a picture. But it's basically taking apples, oranges, and kiwi fruit and totaling them. <laughs> Let's take a look at KFS implementations at CSU and Haverford and, and University of Utah is um, also exploring that. One of the big things that uh, were made it uh, successful for us is we had presidential leadership and visioning. Our president was thinking about the things on those first 10 slides four years ago when we decided to implement. What's nice is we didn't have to do an RFP for a system. We had to do it for consulting services, but that's far easier. That saved me at least six months of time. We had a great commercial affiliate, and there are great commercial affiliates to help you, and, and they add tremendous value. Our implementation cost was not 1.9 million at CSU. Spencer will talk about his. And our ongoing costs are far less than they would be for a vendor-supported system. Our FTE staffing, um, we're still implementing uh, revisions of KFS and trying to integrate with Rice and Coeus. But we've been through three year ends with Quali Financial System and they've been successful. So talking about our implementation, the first thing to start off with is the reality triangle. We're about a community that builds software. So there's no better functionality you're going to get than quality software because it's by higher ed for higher ed. And with better software, it saves you money and it saves you time. And in fact, all three of these things trade off against each other. When we went to our president and tried to sell the concept of community source, we used this triangle to sell it to him. And to quote one of our distinguished politicians, we sold it to him with one word, and that word was arithmetic. <laughs> we basically, using better software and the community source model, kept millions of dollars in college budgets, and we got better software along with it. So what's wrong with that? And we implemented it in a shorter time period. 
So it is indeed better software. So, oh, it's the software. <laughs> we went live on July 1st, 2009, and it was on a pre-release version of KFS. We would never have done that without, with, with vendor software. We went live because the community all around the country stepped up and helped us go live. And after we went live, they supported it better, too. So, oh, it's the community. 1.9 million implementation, 150K per year in maintenance because we're a KFS sustainability partner. So, oh, it's the money. We all have seen the project hype cycle before where there's the technology trigger and positive hype and the peak of inflated expectations and then the negative hype and the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> and then we go up the slope of enlightenment and plateau on the plateau of productivity. So that's from the Gartner Group. And I showed this at the Yukon kickoff days. This is the misery bucket. Well, we all know that no large IT system implementation is an IT project. It's a functional project that IT supports. But we've been through three of these in the last 10 years. And there's a full bucket of misery that comes along with every large-scale system implementation. And you have to eat it. You have to eat it all. And you're not done until you eat it all. You can eat it fast, or you can eat it slow. But you have to eat it, and you have to eat it all. So there, you can see where our bucket of misery was in the trough of disillusionment. That is our uh, project cycle overlaid on the project hype cycle. <laughs> and you know, you have to plan for you know, a one to two year implementation or so, and then you have to plan for a year of sweep up after that, and that, you gotta eat that whole bucket of misery. <laughs> So KFS was our most successful implementation effort. Yes, we did it and we succeeded and it's really great software. So we're gonna look at quality systems first in terms of all of our future projects. And our message to you is come on in, the water's fine and you don't even have to dip your toe in, you can dive in unlike the mountain streams of Colorado. Now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, Spencer from Haverford. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, I got it on the first try. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, go back a couple of slides, if I can. So that's a pretty interesting slide. Um, pretty wide range. You've all probably figured out by now, Haverford is a pretty small institution, 1,200 students. There was talk um, about five years ago of expanding it to 1,400, and the alumni went crazy, and we gave that up. <laughs> um, I can say that because I'm one of those alumni. Um, anyway, so it's a small institution, and a lot of the um, constraints that higher ed finds itself under are doubled and tripled in, in small institutions with limited um, endowment. So if we look at this, if we look at this slide, um, I actually am relatively new to Haverford, came about a year and a half ago. And um, before I joined, I was talking with the president and he was, I, I came from, I actually came not from higher ed, but from the corporate world. And he was talking about this, uh, this new system that the CIO was talking about uh, possibly bringing in called Koali. And, Never heard of it, didn't, had no idea what it was, but it was clear that the president had, um, had drunk the Kool-Aid and realized that Kuali represented something different, not just for large institutions like Colorado State, but for small places like Haverford College. So um, shortly after that, I joined and um, along with, with the CIO, helped, um, helped bring the rest of the institution on board for the idea of community source software and specifically um, quality financial system. So um, as you can see, the uh, uh, I, I want to say, Pat, your implementation course is only twice as much as ours, and you're more than twice as big as we are. So I'm very impressed with what you've accomplished. But uh, I think we've done pretty well as well. Um, 
So let me go back to my slides. Okay, so the reality triangle, I've expanded the triangle a little bit. Looks a little bit like a square now. Um, that, was, that was on purpose. So uh, let's talk about time. So, so we had a board mandate at Haverford um, that we had to replace our legacy system. It was 30 years old and barely met audit requirements and certainly did not meet user requirements. So time was critical. Um, functionality, we needed to do everything larger schools do, only we needed to do it with less people. And of course, dollars. We, um, Haverford traditionally until recently had spent almost nothing on, um, on things like infrastructure, systems infrastructure and applications. We got along with our 30 year old custom built system for years and years and years. So although we changed that model, uh, Joe Spadaro, the CIO and I, with help from myself and others, helped change that model, but um, it's still limited dollars. And then finally, collaboration. So the bottom line is, a school like us, small liberal arts school, we can't do something as robust and as, um, as really model changing as Kuali without help, help from the community, of which we got a ton, both before we decided to go with KFS and after we started implementing, and even now when we're done implementing. Um, and, and collaboration with other schools. We, we, um, we have a tight, a tight uh, relationship with a sister school called Bryn Mawr College down the road. And although they're not on Kuali, um, when we decided to move forward, the intent was that we'll jump in the water and, um, and they will, will hopefully follow suit shortly. So collaborating together on applications as well as other IT initiatives is key to a small school like us making progress. In fact, right now, um, while we're here, uh, St. Olaf and Carlton from Minnesota are, are both at Haverford uh, right now talking with, with our folks about how we collaborate with our local um, brother and sister consortium schools in order to do more with less. Okay, so we, we, just, we uh, had to make a choice. What are we going to do? So we, we basically, we didn't do a full, a full RFP by any stretch, but we looked at three types of options. We looked at the robust tier one commercial systems, the people sauce of the world, the banners. We looked at um, smaller, less robust, less expensive commercial software. In our case, it was um, Blackboard's Financial Edge, mainly because our sister school was using them. And then we looked at Kuali as um, sort of the future, more strategic approach of a community sourced, robust, and continually evolving opportunity for us to improve the way we do things at Haverford. So um, it, it, it took a while. There was a lot of um, sturm and drang as we, as we worked across campus, functional and technical people, to, um, to figure out what the right answer was within our constraints. But eventually, once everyone sort of realized what Kuali and KFS had to offer, our selection committee um, came to unanimous conclusion to move forward with KFS. So real quick uh, project timeline. The board mandate came in the fall of 2010. In um, July of 2011, uh, I came on board and, and helped drive uh, the final decision to go forward with KFS. We kicked the project off in September. Did some sort of soft planning for a month or two. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the real work started in November. We trained folks in June. We went live in July. So that's eight or nine months of real work for the implementation. Pretty fast. Um, we are small, so that helps. We were um, working off of um, less than ideal processes, so we were open to changing our processes, and that helps. Um, and finally, we had the support of the community. We had the, um, the KCAs who were there to support us. We ended up using Navigator Management Partners, and they were great. Um, but the community as a whole, we really felt that they viewed Haverford's implementation as an opportunity. We came right on the heels of Stevens, which was the first small school, and we, and, but we were even smaller and, and, and less technical, and, and the community came together to help us and make sure that we were going to be successful because 
they wanted to prove and we wanted to prove that this would work for a school like Haverford and others similar. So uh, bottom line is we did it for about for under a million dollars, kept it to six figures, and um, a, a large part of that was consulting expenses. Um, a, a significant part, maybe 15% of that, was simply um, backfill costs to, to bring in staff to do regular jobs while our people um, worked on the project. Um, so we had temporary staff increase. We had no permanent staff increase, and we're pretty proud of that. Um, at, at a at a place like Haverford with limited budgets, um, getting approval to hire a new permanent hire is, uh, is extraordinarily difficult in these times. But um, bottom line is the software was the right, robust software for any school, large or small. The community was there to help us, and they really did. And the money, we, we, could, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't turn down the fact that we could do this, get the robust software we needed, Far le for far less money than uh, we would have spent had we gone with a PeopleSoft or a Banner or another commercial vendor. So um, we really had a goal. I had a personal goal to prove to Haverford and to the greater world that we could do this, that a small school with a limited budget and very limited time, because our mandate said we had to have something that worked up and running by the end of fiscal year 12. So I, I really, I, I was gonna prove that we could do this with Kuali, we could do it successfully, and that others can do it as well. And um, the reason we're, I'm here and many of my colleagues are to spread that word and uh, hopefully get um, folks to uh, join us, jump in the water, and join the party. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Eric Denna, from University of Utah, to talk about a possibly up-and-coming I've noticed the clock, and I've got to hurry. So um, Pat, may, Pat uh, painted a pretty interesting picture about the, the situation that we find ourselves in in higher ed, and it reminded me of a recent uh, little vacation that I took with my father and brothers. Now you may look at this picture and say, vacation? <laughs> this is Smoke Creek, California, where my dad grew up. And we gather here every year to go back and let my dad reminisce and, and kind of tour around the area. Um, you'll notice that it's not a lot like Austin. There's not a lot of foliage, but there's a lot of rock. It's pretty rough terrain. The question I'd ask you is if you were driving through Smoke Creek, which car would you pick? Now here's the interesting thing. You can actually, with enough time and money, you can turn a Ferrari into an off-road vehicle. This is actually a Ferrari Baja. Uh, so the, the question you may be tempted to ask yourself is, do we have enough time and money to turn that, to turn a Ferrari into a Ferrari Baja. I would ask, is that really the most important question? Do we have enough time and money? <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about the University of Utah and uh, where we find ourselves and the recent decision that we've made. So, people, so the U is one of the original PeopleSoft schools. The University of Michigan, the University of Utah, a few other, a handful of schools invested in this, um, in the software. Very conservatively speaking, and many have told me when I've shown them this figure of $75 million, they say that I'm about 50% under. So a lot of people would say we've spent over $100 million on PeopleSoft over the last decade plus. One of the more interesting things is in an effort to turn this Ferrari into a Baja, we've made over 18,000 modifications to PeopleSoft. Now, I told the guys to stop counting. I think I see Joe out there in the crowd. I said, just stop counting. I think we've made our point. I've yet to find anyone who comes close to us in the number of modifications. I think we win the prize. I'm not sure what that prize is, but um, I think we've won it. So when I, when I first came on board, we started asking a lot of questions about, so what are we going to do? What, what, where we find ourselves, are we going to make it? Are we going to buy it? Are we going to customize? Are we going to adapt? You know, you've, 
you know the drill. Every time some software decision comes up, we start asking ourselves these questions. <clears throat> this all led to an interesting conversation over the summer with our president. I came to Kuali days a year ago in Indianapolis. And I left. There, there was actually a group of us that came, uh, some people from finance, from HR, um, no one from student. When I left, I turned to my functional partners and said, so, so what do you think? And frankly, I wasn't getting a lot of traction with finance and HR. But I found myself in a conversation with our new um, Associate Vice President of Strategic Enrollment in Student Affairs. And she had a vision about where she wanted to go with student uh, services in the future and had uh, the Vice President of Student Affairs right there with her. We started talking about uh, joining the Kuali student effort. All of that culminated in a conversation with our president, a new president at the University of Utah, who's a computational scientist. I mean, he gets technology. He understands this stuff. I found myself in this interesting moment in our conversation where Dave, our, our president, asked me this question. I want to invest in my priorities. Why don't we just fix our PeopleSoft mess? And it was, it was one of those moments where all the oxygen was kind of sucked out of the room, and everyone was kind of looking at me, saying, Eric, why can't you fix the PeopleSoft mess? And I asked Dave, I said, Dave, I'm not sure that's the right question. And he kind of looked at me like, okay, smarty pants, what's the right question? <clears throat> what model do you want to invest in for the next 10 years? That turned the whole conversation, and the result of that is this. The University of Utah has joined Kuali Rice as an investing partner and Kuali student. This is a presidential priority. We're starting the conversations about KFS and KPME, but have not made those decisions yet. But I hope that under the, the fact that we're jumping into uh, Kuali Student, which is um, not a completed project, I hope shows our commitment that we're all in on Kuali and, uh, and very excited about what the future holds. So thank you. So we've been asking ourselves for some time now. So this is a great community to join, and it saves so much money and produces better software. Where is the stampede? So certainly, I think we need to be feel we need to head toward a quality ERP. Even though Gartner and other analysts are saying nowadays that best of breed is obtaining favor over ERPs because of all the service-oriented architectures and the things that they enable. Those are some additional quality projects as well that you, one might consider joining and investing in. So let's talk about compare and contrast now. The quality motivation is to build community. We com build community via community source software systems and implementations, as opposed to the vendor motivation, which is to increase profit. And the functional comparison, we've seen that quality produces better code versus some of the legacy code that we've seen. Uh, and I can tell you some horror stories if you corner me somewhere. And, and our uh, implementation was speedy, and, and you know Spencer's was exceptionally speedy, and uh, vendor implementations have been, shall we say, more deliberate. And what really drove it home to me was we've been through three best of breed large scale system implementations in the last 10 years. And when we were vendor systems, the staff were not smiling. They were quite distressed at times and most of the time. Our staff felt that they were part of a community, part of something bigger than themselves. They were more productive and they were happier and they smiled throughout our KFS implementation. And that made a huge impact. And that was the functional staff as well as the IT staff. And in fact, it was a university project. It wasn't an IT project, and it wasn't a finance project. It was a university project, and we were happy going through that, even while eating that bucket of misery. 
And so the question is, where do we wish to be in 2020? It's Eric's question uh, to his president. And so we are instituting the Koali Pick One Initiative. Take these brown chopsticks that you have. Everybody hold them up, please. And look at them. Gaze upon them. There is nothing written on them. These chopsticks are for you to take back and put on your desks and to pick a Koali system. Pick one. If you aren't in Koali already, use these to remind you to pick one. If you're already doing a Koali system, pick another one. <laughs> it's time to double down. Higher education is entering a different era. Our presidents are going to look to every VP and say, what can you do? They're going to point at us, I guarantee you, and say, what can you do to make higher education more affordable in the next decade? What can you do to provide better online functionality and better self-service? Look at these chopsticks and answer the question yourselves. I think that's what we have for today. So we'll be around. Treasure these chopsticks and motivate yourselves into action via them. Thank you all very much for your attention.